Okay, I guess we can get started and let's uh, begin with prayer. We thank you, Lord, for revealing to us the truths of the Bible through parables. We pray that these parables that we study tonight may prove to be a blessing in our lives through the wisdom that you share with us. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And we also welcome you folks who are out there online and glad you could join us here. Okay, uh, <clears throat> we are coming to what is probably uh, the classic of all parables. Uh, Jesus has taught many different truths in these parables, uh, uh, but these are, when we get to the parable of the lost son, uh, we have probably hit the peak of uh, what is revealed to us in parables. So, starting with Luke chapter 15, verse 11. Jesus continued, <coughs> there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, so that he began to be in need. He went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country to, who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion with him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to his father, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. And what's lost and is found. So they began to celebrate, which is the first part of the parable. But <clears throat> uh, that, of course, uh, uh, follows on the two parables that we just had gone through. Uh, the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost coin and what was the point of both of those parables? The lost sheep and the lost coin, the point was? Well, that they're lost Christians, I mean lost people that come to Christ. Okay, the joy in heaven over one sinner who is who has repented. And <clears throat> And uh, uh, this just introduces the parable that we have today. And essentially, uh, the point is the same. Uh, in the parable of the lost son, uh, <clears throat> of course, uh, uh, the lost son is the same thing as the lost sheep and the lost coin. And what's the father's reaction when the uh, lost son shows up? Joy. It's joy. Joy in heaven over one lost sinner who repents. Yes? 
Well, what I noticed that it struck me there is he must have been looking for him to come back all the time because he said he noticed him from afar. So he had to be watching, you yep. know, and yeah, that's exactly yeah. the picture, you know, you see, uh, like uh, the father is living in this ranch house and then there is this long trail that goes off to the horizon and that's how we get there. And so uh, the father is glancing down that road, you know, not 24 hours a day, but he keeps on looking so that when the sun shows up, at the end of the trail there, uh, the father recognizes his, recognizes him and goes for, uh, goes after him. Now, uh, <clears throat> that is, uh, so we got to the point of the parable. Anything else to say about this parable? And, well, of course, there's quite a bit more to go with it. And the, uh, <clears throat> and the, uh, uh, well, when it came to the lost sheep, uh, was that the sheep's fault? When it came to the lost coin, was that the coin's fault? When it came to the lost son, was that the son's fault? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, we probably wouldn't feel too sorry for the lost son. Why not? He made his choice. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't deserve any sympathy from his father. Why not? Well, because he's the one that left. He chose to leave. He took his father's money, his inheritance. He said, I don't want to, want to wait till you die, Dad. I want my share now. So, the father was able to do that. He liquidated half of his estate and gave a considerable sum of money to the son. And so, of course, the point of the parable here is your, if your son ever asks you for, or daughter ever asks you for half of the inheritance, what, you should, what should you say? No. <laughs> so, you, 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 you don't have any hope of that anymore, bro. Okay. <clears throat> the, Half of the penny is not very <laughs> Okay, so uh, the son is, is detestable. Not only does his greed uh, get him uh, all half of his father's wealth, but what does he do with that wealth? He wastes it. Squanders it. Wild, okay. Wild living. Let's uh, uh, <clears throat> put that in modern day terms. So, uh, well, this wouldn't exactly be a distant country, but uh, let's say uh, that uh, the son uh, leaves Nampa and heads for Las Vegas. Okay. Well. And what does he do with his father's money there in Las Vegas? Parties, he drinks, he gambles it away, and spends it on anything. Wild women and gambling, <laughs> alcohol, drugs, prostitutes, uh, any kind of pleasure that you can get out of this world. He spent his life in riotous living. And, uh, and of course, as long as he had lots of money, he had lots of friends. What happened when he ran out of money? No more friends. No more friends. He didn't have any friends anymore. And it just so happened that about the time he ran out of money, uh, there was a shortage of food in the country. Uh, and he had to survive somehow. And what was the job he got? Feeding pigs. Okay. And that's and bad for that would not be <laughs> oh, yeah. the worst thing you could think of, except that 
In Jesus' parable, it was the worst thing you could think of. What? Because uh, a pig to the Jew is unclean. Yeah. An unclean animal. A pig was a dirty, filthy animal. And you wouldn't think of eating pork because that pork was produced by such a filthy animal. Now, that's not the way we look at it. Uh, <coughs> pork chops are our favorite. Uh, uh, and uh, spare ribs, you can include them. Bacon, you know, what would we do without yeah. that stuff? But in the culture of the Jews, uh, <coughs> Uh, eating pigs was uh, uh, something like uh, eating uh, dog meat. And so if you go to Albertson, look in the meat counter, where do you find the dog meat? <laughs> Next to the pork. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you don't find it because yeah. nobody would eat it. Nobody, if you had somebody yeah, come over to your house and tell them, just joking, yeah. Uh, uh, I'm serving you dog meat tonight. Uh, you probably save a lot of money that way because nobody would eat very much. Uh, okay, so feeding pigs was as, as low as you could get, but he didn't even get the pig meat. Now it says he came to his senses. Uh, what does that mean? Well, I think a realize, he realizes what he left behind. He came to his senses. Uh, uh, <clears throat> when we talk about an alcoholic coming to his senses, uh, what's the expression there? He hit the bottom. bottom. Oh. Yeah, he hit rock bottom. Yeah. When everything was gone, he finally realized what was important. And he had wasted his inheritance on foolishness. But that is not the point of the parable. I mean, it would be a good lesson to learn, you know. Uh, don't waste your life on riotous living. Look at where you end up hitting rock bottom. Uh, the point of the parable is that the son realized how detestable he was. And the only place he knows where he can go and, and get uh, a few crumbs of bread is that at his father's house. But how can he go back help after what he has done? You know, he's come to his senses. I wasted the whole thing. And I am a disgrace to my father. The only way I can hope to get back to my father is how? By being a servant. Yeah. I don't deserve to be your son anymore. I, <clears throat> uh, but maybe, uh, maybe he'll let me work for him. And, you know, you can, uh, well, it's kind of hard to imagine going back to the place where you were the father's son, respected, respectable, and all the servants looking up to you, and now you come groveling back, uh, you know, Please accept me as your servant. Okay. But, of course, the, fa the father didn't take him up on that. Now, probably, when, when the son came back with this uh, uh, line in his mind, um, what should the father have said? I don't want you, you mean you expect me to trust you to work for me after what you did? I don't want to see you anymore, get out of here. Now, that would have been fair. But of course, instead, 
The father sees him coming a long way off. He's always been hoping that that son would come up. He doesn't wait for the son to come. He runs out to greet him. And he kisses him. By the way, you know, uh, just, this is not important. It's got nothing to do with anything except uh, people have been kissing each other for a long time, haven't they? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it means the same thing. Uh, <clears throat> that the father kisses his son, which means the same thing that it does today. It is an expression of affection. I love you and not only welcoming him back, but why do they kill the fattened calf? Celebrate. 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 Lost this son is back. the best thing that can happen. We got to celebrate. And of course, when we got to celebrate coming to uh, Bible class on Monday night, what do we have to do? Cheesecake. Eat cheesecake. <laughs> have some cheesecake. Yeah. Two pieces. We got to <laughs> celebrate with food. Okay. And, and the fattened calf. Uh, is uh, I, I really, you know, even back in Montello where we got a lot of farmers, I don't know about anybody keeping up the fat and calf, but this is the uh, a, a symbol of the best possible meat that you can serve. They didn't kill an old cow that was done uh, producing milk. Uh, here was a calf tender and and prepared for a special occasion uh, a real celebration so uh, you know he didn't uh, <clears throat> he didn't take his son out to McDonald's for supper uh, we went to the fanciest restaurant in town and <coughs> for that there was the fattened calf and it was a wonderful celebration now, the point of the parable we already figured out, <clears throat> and the point of the parable, uh, how does God feel when his lost son comes back? Overjoyed. Well, yeah. He is oh, overjoyed joyful. for everyone that comes back into, uh, into the kingdom of God. And, of course, uh, uh, what is now the point of the parable gets a little clearer uh, because uh, uh, who is represented by the uh, wayward son? Uh, sinners. sinners yes. yeah. Which sinners? Uh, I think believers, believers that have fell away. away. <clears throat> Is yeah, it? them too. Oh, them too. Uh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh them too. Well, oh, I don't think so. Uh, you don't think God's pleased? Oh, we yeah, have is, but what this represents. never oh, wasted this our Heavenly Father's blessings on selfish pleasure, have we? Oh, no. <laughs> I wouldn't think of doing anything <laughs> like that. Uh, if we uh, look at our favorite sins, whatever they may be, and, you know, you get reminded of them every once in a while, and uh, whether it's pornography or gossip or uh, self-indulgence or angry outbursts, uh, whatever our... Uh, <clears throat> our favorite sins may be, uh, where do those sins land us in, far, in terms of God's favor? Mm -hmm. They're against us. Thanks. And so, if we expect God to be fair, do we say, God received me as a son or daughter? That he isn't. If I'm lucky, God will take me back as a servant. But see, that's not the way it is. 
that our Heavenly Father, as often as we come to Him, He is more than welcome to receive us. Uh, there is some unusual theology here. Uh, <clears throat> I'm reminded of the uh, second verse of Amazing Grace that isn't in our hymnal because it says, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fear relieved. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed." Well, now, there are some good reasons why that was left out of the hymnal, but what about this line, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear." Does grace make us afraid? No, no, I don't think so. Grace. Uh, well, yes. no, because did because of his yeah. grace we're happy. Yeah, see that that yeah. that's a strange yeah, expression. Yeah. Was grace that taught my to heart fear. to fear. Uh, yeah. but there's also the psalm that says, There is forgiveness with thee, therefore thou art feared. How in the world does God's forgiveness make us afraid? And the answer is that we aren't really able to acknowledge our guilt unless we are sure of that forgiveness. The Father's uh, the son came back to his father because he had some hope not to be received as a son, but at least to be received as a servant. If he hadn't had that hope, would he have come back to his father and say, Father, no. I do not deserve my, your, to be your son, but accept me as a servant? No. He had hope in that his father would forgive him to that extent that he would let him be a servant. And of course he got a lot more than that. But that when we don't know God's forgiveness, uh, we don't dare acknowledge how guilty we are tendency is, well, these are just minor sins. I didn't hurt anybody. I just uh, hurt myself, maybe. These are minor sins, and so cover them up, forget about them. But we don't have to cover up those minor sins. We can acknowledge them. Why? Because God is, I mean, Jesus has already taken care of them for us. Because there is forgiveness. And that is the other point of the parable that we are the way that we are the lost son. And as often as it happens, as often as we fall into sin, we can always come back to our Heavenly Father and what's He going to do? Forgive us. Going to kill the fatted cat and have a big celebration to have you back again. Beautiful uh, parable. Somebody uh, uh, oh, had the idea of, uh, uh, well, how do you describe God? And some people would say, uh, God is like the, uh, the traffic cop. You broke the law, you're going to pay for it. God is a judge who gives you what you deserve. Then here is the other uh, picture of God like a uh, uh, sleepy grandpa on the porch while his grandchildren are tearing up the house and he says, oh well, you're just kids, that's okay. 
And well, uh, that's not the way God is either. God is not all law. God is not. <coughs> you get away with anything. God is like the father in the parable of the prodigal son. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> and well, that's. Uh, oh, by the way, uh, uh, does anybody know that this is a parable about the prodigal son? Uh, if you've heard that yeah, before, I've heard that. Yeah. yeah, of course, and uh, that's not uh, NIV language, and so in NIV we don't call him the prodigal son anymore. We call him the lost son, uh, but the word prodigal uh, means like prodigious uh, disobedience. Uh, and not just a little bit neglectful or not just a little bit disobedient, but hugely disobedient. And so that, uh, that doesn't all come out <coughs> if you just say the lost son, uh, but who knows what prodigal means anymore. So if we, it's okay if we say lost son, as long as we know who that is. But this isn't the end of the parable. The parable goes on, Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back <coughs> safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. <coughs> so his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never even gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. When this son of yours who has squandered <coughs> your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again, was lost and is found. Okay. <coughs> the older son wants what? Fair he wants fairness. <coughs> he wants yeah. justice. And what is, what is uh, just in what the father is doing? That isn't fair. To have a big party for this worthless son of yours. And I'm the good guy. And I deserve at least a young goat so I can have a party. <coughs> Okay, and so the father says, well, if that's the way you feel about it, you don't have to come. What does the father say? He says, you have always been with me. Everything is yours. The father said, come in and celebrate with us. This is the right thing to do. <coughs> And if you, uh, it's just so great that your brother is back again. And of course, now when we come to the parable of the lost son, um, which son are we more likely to identify with? Sometimes both. No, I think so. The younger one or the older one? The older. Older. Well, probably the older. We, we, we need to know about the grace of God in, 
and how he accepted that younger son, but we probably can't really identify. Of course, I don't know you guys that well. Maybe uh, there is something in your past that would fit here with the prodigal son, but I am assuming not. So the uh, the younger, uh, yeah. the one that we can most readily identify with is the older brother. Um. And why is that? Are we more interested in justice or are we more interested in mercy? Well, we're probably more interested in mercy for us, but <laughs> justice for somebody else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, and that's about the way it goes. Yeah. And it, when yeah. the bad guys get what they got coming, we say, yes. Good, glad to hear that. And so how many people are interested in uh, visiting uh, mass murderers on death row. Not very now, very some many. people do that, uh, but that wouldn't be my first idea of a good time. Uh, back in Wisconsin, I uh, once a month I spend a Bible class with, at uh, the Fox Lake Correctional <coughs> Institute, and. Uh, uh, not scary at all. Uh, these guys are uh, you know, just like this Bible class, except there's only one gender, but uh, they're answering the questions and participating, and I can't imagine what they have done that they are required to be in prison for a while. Uh, but, uh, <clears throat> yeah, when it when it comes <coughs> to our hearts, the legalism in all of us is more interested in justice than in mercy. And so when uh, Jesus talks about the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son, now what's in the lost son parable that's not in the lost coin and the lost sheep? Well, he, the lost son, he did it all himself. I mean, he ran away. The coin just was lost. Nobody... Anybody well, okay. That. All right, that is that is correct, but that's not the answer I was looking for. When oh. the son came back, he realized he had done wrong, and he returned on his own. In you don't see anybody complaining about the shepherd going after the lost sheep, do you? <clears throat> you don't see anybody complaining about the widow spending all that time looking for her lost coin. But now in the parable of, of the lost son, here you see somebody complaining yeah. when the lost son is so wonderfully received. And uh, uh, there is, uh, you know, when, when you think of the uh, sins that, uh, uh, that we are guilty of, could you include the fact that we are glad when people get what they deserve? No, I'm glad uh, I don't get what I deserve. <laughs> uh, you know, th this is the other point of the parable. Not just that the, uh, not just that the heavenly Father is glad to receive sinners like us, but also, uh, what is our proper attitude when God receives sinners? Joy. To rejoice, to come in and celebrate, and for the son, the older son, to be as happy as the father is that the 
uh, wayward son has come back. Okay. Now, I made that I made that uh, parable last as long as I possibly could. Because the next one talks about the shrewd manager. I don't know what that parable means. <laughs> I've been working on it, so I got some ideas for you, but uh, <clears throat> just a little background on this. Uh, the uh, the problem is is basically in verse nine where it <laughs> says, "I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself, so that it, when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings." What does that mean? Make friends to yourself with worldly wealth so that when your worldly wealth is gone they may receive you into eternal dwellings which might be must be hell so heaven, yeah. heaven. well how are you supposed to make friends to yourself uh, <clears throat> uh, with worldly wealth in order that they may receive you uh, into heavenly dwellings. Well, uh, <clears throat> the uh, if you're screwing up your eyebrows here, that's a right. To, uh, that's about where I am too. Uh, you know, what on earth does that mean? Only it gets worse uh, because this was one of the historical readings that. Early in my ministry, it was automatic, and every church, uh, every year on this particular Sunday of the church here, we read this parable. And I read that parable because it was there, and I read this parable to the congregation uh, without knowing what it means. And I'm not proud of that. What should a good pastor do? Learn. I guess he should have studied and found out what it did mean. Uh, did you go to school? <laughs> Better yet. Better yet, he should have read a different section of scripture. Uh, this doesn't happen often, but it happens every once in a while, and uh, I have uh, complained to the authorities about it that if we're going to read a section of scripture without any detailed explanation of it, it better be something that is readily understood. Well, what the authorities tell me is that the people in the pew are a lot smarter than you think they are, and I doubt that. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so uh, what, what but, does it mean? Uh, I had some comfort because uh, not too long ago, Mark Jeske, does that name ring any bells? Mm. Okay, uh, Mark Jeske was for 25 years my neighbor in Milwaukee. Uh, we spent generous time together, uh, but now uh, he is the featured speaker on a television program called Time of Grace. And I, I think it's available uh, <clears throat> on the internet if you know where to look, and I can't tell you because I don't have that information along with me. I assume that it's not uh, regularly on TV in this area. But anyhow, uh, Pastor Jeske is so smart that people, laymen, came and said, would you be the speaker on a nationwide television show? And so, and he said, for a long time, I didn't know what this parable meant either. 
So I don't feel so bad, but it is a parable that uh, is, to say the least, confusing. I think I've got some answers for you, but uh, uh, I, I heard this from Pastor Jeske. Uh, Time of Grace uh, sends out a little magazine, and I was reading that. And I said, yes, finally somebody understands this, said it so I can understand it. And then I forgot what it was. <laughs> So then I called Pastor Jeske and I said, can you explain that? And so he explained it to me again, and I forgot it again. <laughs> so I can't tell you what Pastor Jeske's answer was, but we'll get to something here anyhow in the parable of the shrewd manager. Chapter, Luke chapter 16, Jesus told his disciples, there was a rich man whose manager was accused of wasting his possessions. So he called him in and asked him, What is this I hear about you? Give an account of your management, because you cannot be manager any longer. The manager said to himself, What shall I do now? My master is taking away my job. I'm not strong enough to dig, and I'm ashamed to beg. I know what I'll do. When I, so that when I lose my job here, people will welcome me into their houses. So he called each one of his master's debtors and asked the first, How much do you owe my master? Nine hundred gallons of olive oil, he replied. The manager told him, Take your bill, sit down quickly and make it four hundred and fifty. And he asked the second, And how much do you owe? A thousand bushels of wheat, he replied. He told him, take your bill and make it 800. The master commended the dishonest manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the people of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own kind than are the people of light. I tell you, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourselves so that when it is gone, you will be welcomed into eternal dwellings. And, okay. Uh, <clears throat> uh, oh yeah. As I'm trying to figure out what this parable <coughs> is, I looked in the library over here and my old English professor, Werner Frontsman, has a uh, commentary on the uh, New Testament. And so I checked to see what Werner Frontsman, uh, and, and it, it is, there's three thick books up there by Werner Frontsman, uh, and so you should look at them, an old friend of mine. Uh, <clears throat> well, I looked for Matthew or Luke 16, in Frontsman's commentary, and it wasn't there. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know what it meant either. <laughs> okay, so why did Jesus tell this story, and what can we learn from it? And, well, the first thing we learn is that it's a good idea to cheat your boss. Uh, no. <laughs> That's not what the parable is about. It, now, why, the next thing is, why did the uh, rich man praise this uh, dishonest uh, manager? Because he acted shrewdly about something. He was acting shrewdly. He was cheating the boss, and the boss was losing money on account of him. But he wasn't losing at all. the manager was friends. doing something smart. He was making friends. And what was he doing? Relieving some of the debt. Well, he, he was said making he friends. Was making friend. He was making friends. <clears throat> 
Now, he was doing it in a dishonest way, but since he knew he was going to get kicked out, he made provisions for his future using the worldly wealth that was at his disposal so that there would be people who would receive him after he lost his job. They owed him something. Now, the point of the parable is not that you should cheat your boss. Why was the manager praised by the owner? Because he acted shrewdly, is what it says. He I... acted shrewdly by using what was available to make friends for himself. Now, does Jesus expect the children of light to do the same thing? No, no. He says that the worldly people are more, <clears throat> uh, the worldly people are smarter about worldly things than the children of light. And, uh, okay, uh, why is that? Jesus is making sure that we don't get the idea that we're supposed to do what this shrewd manager was doing. That's the first thing. The people, that's the way the people of the world act. But Jesus is using this example to talk about making friends for yourself so that when your worldly wealth is gone, they may receive you into eternal habitations. Now, how are we, if we are going to make friends for ourselves, use worldly wealth. Now this, this starts to make a little bit of sense now, doesn't it? Uh, you use worldly wealth to make friends for yourself. <coughs> uh, how can you do that? Well, to me, what it, I don't know, it, it means to use your worldly wealth to help the poor. To, you, you don't keep it to yourself. You use it for your friends. Loan them money. Do whatever it does. And that, therefore, they're going to be your friends. And then when you, because, you know, God says to help the poor and give generously, that so when you die, you're good, not going to have any of your will to go with then. And then you'll be welcomed into heaven. Uh, <clears throat> I think. I believe <laughs> well, that, that's pretty good, by the way. I, I, uh, uh, I, I'm glad that we got that, uh, that figured out. Uh, just uh, uh, to throw in a little bit more confusing, uh, I think there is a mistranslation here. Uh, when I looked at the Greek here, and I don't always look at the Greek, but with this one I had to because I didn't know what they were talking about. Uh, <clears throat> but it says, when it is gone, the Greek says, they will welcome you. Now, who's going to welcome you? The friends you have made with the mammon or with the uh, uh, worldly wealth, uh, <clears throat> uh, use worldly wealth to gain friends for yourself. Uh, how can you gain friends that will receive you into heaven?
by donating to Time of Grace. No, no. What did you say? By donating to Time of Grace. We don't. What is that? Time of Grace is that Pastor Jeske's television program. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. No, that's, uh, that, no, that's, that's just one example, and you know, I, 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 I am scraping here to try and make some sense out of this. Uh, but to me, that does make some sense. If I use my worldly wealth in a way that people share my faith with me and go on to heaven ahead of me, then my, my oh. worldly wealth oh. is gone and I don't need it anymore. They'll be waiting for me in heaven. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. Okay. Okay, that makes some kind of sense, and I don't know what uh, uh, Professor Franzman said about that because I couldn't find it in his book, and uh, I can't remember what Pastor Jeske said about this uh, because I forgot it, but that makes some sense. Uh, like this shrewd manager used worldly wealth to make friends for himself, then we can use our worldly wealth to help people find their way into the kingdom of heaven. So that <clears throat> when, uh, when it's our turn to go to heaven, they will be waiting for us. That kind of makes sense out of the words that are here. <clears throat> And uh, <clears throat> that's not quite the end of the, per uh, of the uh, problem, though, because <laughs> verse 10 goes on to say, Whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. Whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? If you have not been trustworthy with somebody else's property, who will give you property of your own? Now, that's something saying something totally different from verse 9. And the only thing I can figure out is that Jesus is using this parable in two different ways. One is positive, the other is negative. The positive answer is that make friends with worldly wealth so that these friends can welcome you to heaven someday. That's the positive. Now, Jesus is using the same story Shifting gears now, totally. Because the parable not only illustrates about providing, uh, looking ahead to the future, the parable also gives an example of some very negative behavior. So this is the negative at the point of the parable. And so, uh, <clears throat> uh, if you, well, who was it that couldn't be trusted with small things? That was a shrewd manager, wasn't it? Yeah. Uh, on the one hand, he's doing something good and providing for his future, but on the other hand, he shows that he cannot be trusted. And now this is the negative application of the past parable. And by the way, I don't, I've never <clears throat> preached a sermon on this either, and you can see why. <laughs> <clears throat> to, uh, uh, to make, there are so many other passages in the Bible uh, which uh, are so much easier to understand, like Zacchaeus, for instance, last Sunday. Uh, not hard to figure out what that's all about. Uh, but uh, here is the negative don't be distrustworthy 
like the shrewd manager was because if you can't be trusted with little things, who's going to trust you with the big things? What's the point here for you and me? To be faithful with little things? Taking care of your ordinary everyday responsibilities, you know, change your oil every 3,000 miles and stuff like that. If you can't be trusted to take care of the little things, will God trust you with bigger things? And see, that's the negative. Um, this uh, the <coughs> uh, is the, was the uh, uh, shrewd manager going to get a bigger job because he was so clever? No, he's going to get fired. I can't trust you with little things. I can't trust you with big things. And that is the uh, the secondary application of the parable, and that is uh, hopefully uh, has not been a total waste of time here uh, for me to be talking about something when I don't really know what I'm talking about, uh, but probably there are some good ideas here, and that leaves us with uh, uh, three more parables. And you're already wondering how is pastor going to make three parables last two more weeks. And I have a solution to that problem. Okay, so uh, whenever we get done with, uh, uh, with these parables, it's kind of interesting uh, that these parables are found only in three Gospels. Which gospel is lacking in parables? John. Yeah, John. John. Yeah, John. Yeah. No parables there. Why is that? Why? Yeah. <laughs> On the other hand. Why is that? Why is that? Uh, be, well, because Matthew, Mark, and Luke wrote the first three gospels, and John wrote the fourth one. <laughs> I... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, I don't know of every reason. In fact, I never knew that was the case until I, until I started looking up the parables and found them they were all in three Gospels. So John's Gospel does not include parables, but it is rich in word pictures. And word pictures are kind of like parables, only instead of telling a story to illustrate a point, it uses a symbol to illustrate a point. And so, uh, if depending upon how much time we have left, then uh, when we uh, get done with the parables, we'll be looking at word pictures from the Gospel of John, and then we'll have some fresh sheets ready for that time. Okay, let's conclude with prayer. We thank you, Lord, for revealing your truth to us, and we ask you to make us patient and understanding when there are truths that perhaps we have not really grasped. Help us to remember that the real truths of the Bible are always plain and simple enough for little children, and teach us to put our trust in those truths even when there are portions of Scripture that we do not and cannot totally understand. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for the cheesecake. That was a real treat. All you people who are out there watching online, sorry you couldn't get any cheesecake, but if you come here next Monday night, you probably get some cheesecake too. You better bring another one. I better bring another one. Yeah. Yeah. He's promised. Maybe they'll all be here. Yeah. That'd be great.